Welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohn. Today our guest is the renowned poet Daniel Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman was named Poet Laureate of the United States from 1973 to 74. He's the author of some 25 books, including An Armada of 30 Whales, chosen by W.H. Auden for the Yale series of Younger Poets, a critical work on Edgar Allan Poe, which was nominated for the National Book Award, and a book-length poem about the Quaker founding of Pennsylvania, Brotherly Love, a finalist for both the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. He is Chancellor Emeritus of the Academy of American Poets and Felix E. Schelling Professor Emeritus at the University of Pennsylvania. Daniel Hoffman, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Thank you. <clears throat> well, that's quite a lot of accomplishments, and I could, I mean, I could list more, but I felt it would take too long for me to, to well, be explaining what you've done, and I thought we can talk about it in the course of this interview. But I wonder if you'd start first by reading a poem, a sonnet, from your latest collection, Makes You Stop and Think, the first sonnet, sure. A Legacy. A Legacy. <clears throat> Wakened by bird calls, I stroll down our lane. I touch the infinite sky, the barbarian sun. I'm tousled by a breeze that smells of rain. I do believe this day has just begun. My legacy from history is now. I'll take it in the air, in the mouth, in the dandel bed, in the savor, in the spending, in the times, in the apple bough. In that dream, my first dream when I was 11, a stifled cry, then joy, I am not dead, for reality is vintage and delicious, especially when you taste it while it brews, because it comes as love comes, heart skips sudden, yet long as a lifetime in a once past wishes, a gift you couldn't have the wit to choose. What a wonderful affirmative poem. Yeah. Well, Could you tell us a little bit about it? Well, that's why I put it first in the book. Uh, I try to lay a claim to all, to everything that happens to, to a person. That's my legacy from history as now. Um, of course, not all days are as bright and sunny as that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are poems in, in, in this book and in my other books that uh, are streaked with other passions, uh, some of them uh, quite uh, uh, quite hard to bear. <laughs> well, I, I guess so. I mean, there are uh, uh, elements of sadness in your poetry, but overall, I think you're, you're a very optimistic poet. Um, you take joy in, in little things in life, and that seems to inform everything you write. You see, even yeah. when a poet writes about something negative, uh, the fact that he puts it into a form uh, controls it, makes it positive. Uh, friendly readers have said of brotherly love that uh, it seems to, uh, to uh, conclude with a sense of the non-fulfillment of, of Penn's ideals, and yet... Uh, the feeling that they get from the poem uh, is positive, and I hope that that's the reason for that. Okay, so you just referred to your poem about the founding of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. Brotherly Love, and it's a, it's, a, it's a long poem. It's a narrative poem, which we don't see much of these days. I wonder if you would address that. Uh, do you think that the long poem is, is out of favor? Will it come back into vogue? What prompted you to write a poem of this sort now, when well, you did? there are several questions there. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> right. Choose the one that you like. Okay. First of all, uh, people are always saying that the long poem is dead, yeah. or the sonnet is dead, or the novel is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is supposed to be dead. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, 
that even if a form uh, isn't being much practiced at that moment, yeah. uh, someone will come along and do it, and do it so well that, uh, oh, well, you can't say the sonnet is dead, <laughs> and yeah. so on. Well, uh, as for how I came to write Brotherly Love, that's an intricate story. Mm -hmm. My wife and I were married in 1948, and she had just been appointed poetry editor of the Ladies' Home Journal, here in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So we started our lives together here. It was a very exciting time to be in Philadelphia because this was under the mayorality of Richardson Dilworth and we had Senator Joe Clark and it was a time of great reform. Mm -hmm. uh, the corrupt Republicans who'd been looting the city were jumping off the upper floors of <laughs> City Hall <laughs> and uh, there was a great sense of possibility in the air. And uh, having come from New York, a city which uh, cannibalizes its own past, as Philadelphia certainly does not. Uh, we were struck by the, the sense of colonial Philadelphia still present in 20th century Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and also by a spirit of cooperation and uh, discussion and uh, uh, an optimistic sense that uh, the problems of the city can be solved if we all get together and work on them. Uh, and collaborate. Uh, and uh, I and others attributed this to the lingering influence of that fellow up on top of City Hall. Uh, at that time, <coughs> uh, there was a, a municipal law saying that that was to be the highest point in, in I Philadelphia. That. I remember that. And that's why that we was... had all those flat top buildings, uh, just a story uh, yeah. lower than that. Well, until uh, Mayor Wilson Good changed it, and then we got the Liberty Towers. Um, well, so you were saying you had come to, where had you come from, New York City? Yes. And uh, so you were not, a, you're not a native Philadelphian. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> after, after more than 50 years, am I still from away? <laughs> you think of yourself as a Philadelphian. Yes, you I obviously do. have this tremendous feeling for the yes. city. So you wrote this well, poem. Well, well let me say that uh, uh, 15 years later, uh, when I was appointed to the post that's now called the Poet Laureate, uh -huh. uh, we were involved in a vicious war into which we had been lied by, by the people on top. And we had a phony Quaker president, uh, Nixon. You know, he okay. was a birthright Quaker. Well, I'm not sure was he birthright or not. But anyway, uh, he was from Whittier, California. And that's a different kind of Quakerism from what we have here in Philadelphia yearly meeting. They have steeple houses and hireling clergy and uh, so on. And uh, more of a uh, uh, well. In now, any, was it was it Richard Nixon who appointed you poet laureate? I got a phone call telling me I'd been appointed, and my first yeah. question was, "Is this position in the executive branch?" I was told, "No, it has nothing to do with the executive branch." So I. Uh, you felt you could accept it. Yes. Okay. Yes. In good conscience. <laughs> Indeed, uh -huh. the appointment was made by the Librarian of Congress, actually. Okay. And this was in 1973. Yes. Well, I got to thinking, what would America be like if a real... Oh, well, I was going to say that uh, Nixon, who would put on a Quaker suit when it, it, it fitted his purposes, like when his daughter Julie got married, he uh, uh, had the band play uh, uh, tunes from his cousin Jessamine West's uh, uh, in the movie that was made from her Quaker novel, the title of which escapes me right now. Anyway... Uh, uh, while that was going on, uh, Nixon's minions were arresting Quakers and others who were protesting the war on the charge of disturbing the peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I got to thinking, what would this country be like if a real Quaker was in charge? And that sent me right back to, uh, to William Penn, who was the forgotten founding father or fa uh, founding grandfather of America, because what was... Uh, cooked up a hundred years after his time in his city, uh, the Constitutional Convention, uh, was really an outgrowth of um, the way in which he envisioned Philadelphia. Uh, this and, is, and is that what this book is about, this poem is about? There? Yes. Uh, I didn't know it was going yeah. to be a long narrative poem when I started. Had you written a narrative poem before? Not like this, yeah. no. Uh, I'd written some poems that had an element of storytelling in them, but nothing like this. I wanted to talk to you about something else mm -hmm. that's interesting about your career. You've been anthologized widely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can pick up an anthology of 
of poetry, and you'll often find one of your poems yeah. there. And yet certain poems seem to recur in these <laughs> anthologies. I mean, I, I've made a list of them. Violence, Bob in the Days of Rin Tin Tin, Rats. Those poems come up again and again. And I wonder what you think of that as a poet. Uh, do you feel that these are the poems that you are, are representative of your work, that you feel you should be known by, or are there works that have been neglected that you think reflect your mm -hmm. sensibility and your your psyche more. <clears throat> uh, what, what's your feeling about these anthologies? Well, first of all, uh, there are very few anthologies that undertake to really represent a poet. Most of them are written to an agenda. Okay. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> uh, I'll give you the title of a couple of uh, anthologies that I'm in. Uh, there's one that uh, is about uh, endangered creatures of the sea. So, you, you so there's bet. already a selection process involved yeah. there. Okay, Another and sometimes is, there must be a po politics also to some of these anthologies. Well, um, poetry is in an endless Balkan war, you know. Right, right. Uh, between uh, open... What do, you, what do you think of a lot of this uh, modern or postmodern poetry that's being written nowadays? Well, in the, um, in the mansion of poetry, there are many rooms, <laughs> and uh, there are different kinds of excellence. Uh, and you do what you can your own way. Something uh, that I've noticed is that there is a tendency to write a lot of confessional, personal poetry now, and that doesn't seem to be an interest of yours. Do you, do you feel a lot of modern poetry is self-indulgent, too interested in the self? Well, the so-called confessional <coughs> uh, kind of poem arose as a rebellion against the uh, uh, impersonal, um, uh, metaphysical, uh, intellectualized, uh, complex lyricism uh, that Eliot, uh, both by precept and example, mm -hmm. uh, had uh, established as the... the uh, uh, I never thought of that. So it was a, a backlash against Eliot's intellectualism and so forth, yes. that we have this very personalized poetry yeah. in the middle of the century, That's the right. 20th century. Yeah. And do you feel we, sw we swung too far in that direction, in your opinion? Well, um, I don't know. For those who like it, there it is. Uh, <laughs> but you don't like it. Well, uh, some of it is, is unmistakably powerful. I mean, uh -huh. Sylvia Plath and some of Lowell and... Uh, a few others. It all began, by the way, with a book of very formal uh, poems, uh, Snodgrass's Heart's Needle. Uh -huh. The poems are in tight quatrains. You think they were by John Crow Ransom, but they're about his divorce and his relationship with his infant daughter and that kind of thing. But that's interesting because you don't normally think of confessional poetry as being formal. No. But that was the beginning. That was the beginning. Huh. And Robert Lowell said that, that that opened his eyes to the possibilities. And uh, so he learned from this younger poet, uh, and uh, he had uh, Lowell had been writing very uh, uh, tightly controlled, mostly religious uh, poems, and suddenly he burst out with life studies, uh, which, which helped was, to turn is the it tide. an extraordinary book. Yeah. Yes, it is. And that was influenced by Snodgrass. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, so, but just to backtrack a moment, you said formal poetry when you spoke about Snodgrass. You write very formal poetry. Sometimes and sometimes. Often. Uh, no, I, I write whatever kind of poem the, the theme demands. Okay. And uh, I, I like to think that a, a poet like a musician should be in command of uh, all of the possibilities of his instrument, which is poetry and the language. Okay. Uh, this is what I admire in Chaucer in his day and in Auden in ours. Uh, and uh, I've tried So to these poems, this latest group of sonnets, they're all 14 line poems. They, they are, are in all the sonnets yeah. in a, over a period of 50 years. It's a, it's a retrospective collection. Of all your sonnets. Well, I not. <laughs> selected almost, sonnets. Almost okay. all. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You also have this tremendous liking for Edgar Allan Poe, and ha he has been an influence on you, although I'm told that you prefer his tales to his poems. Could you address that a little bit? Tell us about what it is about Poe that you find so compelling? In fact, you've written a book. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can get the title. Poe, Poe, Poe. Poe, 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 Poe. As many Poes as there are bells in the refrain of Poe's poem, The Bells. How many is that? 
seven. Seven. Okay. Seven Poe is in the title. Yeah. And the 